All right, so matters, elements, and properties. Um, you, as I said, probably in the Zoom, <laughs> I'm filming this before that, so I don't know, but this is the same information that was in your chapter one guided outline. So if you feel like you understood the guided outline and you don't need this, then you don't have to watch this. If you feel like you want to hear it again or you want to hear it from me or you needed a better explanation, then go ahead and keep watching. So first, matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. So all um, elements, compounds, everything, everything on the planet, even the air around you is matter. All those molecules, all those little like protons and electrons that make up a single atom, they take up space. So that's what you see here in these pictures is you see atoms bonded to other atoms and they all have different shapes, different sizes, um, and they all take up space. So they are all considered matter. We have um, basically two main types of matter. We have elements and compounds. They can be in mixtures, they can be independent, and we'll go into pure substances versus uh, mixtures in just a second. But two types, we have elements, which means that the molecule is made from one type of atom. It doesn't mean it's one atom. Some cases like you see here, um, sodium Na or helium He, those are atoms where they exist as a single unit. But there are other um, elements where the atoms, in order to be more stable, they need to bond to other things. They can't really exist by themselves. They have to grab onto something to um, stabilize. So that's what you see here with like S8. So that's sulfur, and it means we have sulfur eight times. So that's what you see here in these pictures is it's sulfur and how it's all connected. But because every single one of those atoms is sulfur, that still makes it an element. Now, if down here where it says, um, the compound is made of two or more types of elements. So if that was like, uh, if this compound had sulfur and then had oxygen attached or something like that, um, then that's an example of a compound. So two types, water is an example of a compound because it contains hydrogen and oxygen, which is what you see here. Sodium chloride, which is salt, that is considered a compound. It's part sodium, part chlorine. So when there's two types, we consider it a compound. When there's one type, we consider it an element. It's not necessarily based on the amount of atoms. It's based on the type of atoms. Um, our matter has um, two main types of properties. We have intensive and extensive properties. So extensive just means that it depends on the amount. So an extensive property, a good example is mass. If you take a few molecules and put them on the scale, you get one mass and then take a bunch more and put it on, you get a different mass. So mass is extent, it's an extensive property. It depends on how much you have of the sample. Intensive does not, it is independent of the amount. So something like density, um, whether I have a drop of density or a pool, I mean, a drop of water or a pool full of water, the density of water is still one. Um, another example is a boiling point, whether I have a drop of water or a pool full of water, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Um, so that's an intensive property. It's something that's like inherent of the substance and doesn't change based on how much you have. Um, there's two. Uh, so those were like general forms of um, properties. We can further narrow that down to like physical or chemical. Um, physical just means that when you change it, it's still the same substance. So if I took something and like cut it in half, I didn't change the substance, it's still the same. Um, so that is a physical property or a physical change. Um, the thing that confuses people the most where you get confused between physical and chemical is you have to ask yourself, is the substance the same as it before as before and after? So with a physical property or a physical change, the substance will be the same. So a good example is water. When you go from ice to liquid water to water vapor, like a gas, you're changing phases, but it's still H2O. It's just in a different phase, which means the molecules are either spread out more or they're closer together depending on what state you have, but they're all H2O. The molecules are still H2O. So that's a um, like a physical change, but a chemical change, you guys see the example right here. It says methane plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water. So before um, we have 
carbon and hydrogen bonded to make methane. And then after carbon and hydrogen are separate, carbon is in one as carbon dioxide and water's in the other, I mean, hydrogen's in the other as water. So that compound before it actually changed into two separate compounds. Um, that is a chemical change. We do not have the same stuff before as we do after. Um, a pure substance. So I said earlier that matter can be, I mean, it's elements and compounds, but it can either be a pure substance, which doesn't necessarily mean an element. A pure substance could be a compound. It just means that it only contains that compound versus a mixture, which is where you have um, two, two different things that each maintain their own properties. So for an example, um, a pure substance might be something like carbon dioxide. If I just have carbon dioxide, CO2, even though it's a compound, it's still a pure substance. Um, uh, if I had something like air, that would be a mixture because air is carbon dioxide, it's water, it's nitrogen gas, um, it's oxygen gas. Um, when I said water, I meant like water vapor. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff in the air, but there's just a mixture of stuff. These are pure substances. So a compound and an element. Those are examples of pure substances when it's only made of that one thing. Uh, okay. So mixtures, it's a blend of two or more kinds of matter. So like I said before, um, air. Air is a great example because they're not chemically bonded together. You have like oxygen flying next to nitrogen, which is flying next to carbon dioxide, right? It's all sort of like mixed up. Um, so a blend of two or more kinds of matter with no chemical bond. Each substance retains its own property. We know that, um, if, for example, with air, I can breathe oxygen. I'm not breathing in nitrogen. I'm not breathing in carbon dioxide, right? So oxygen still maintains its own properties. I can breathe that in. We can divide mixture into two categories. So the first one is homogenous, which means it's the same throughout, which means if I take a sample from you know, one part and take a sample from another part, it's gonna be the same. So air is a great example. I don't have to like run from pocket of oxygen to the next pocket of oxygen. I can breathe wherever I want because the oxygen is evenly distributed. If I take a sample of air in one place and a sample of air in another place and I evaluate those samples, they're gonna be the same because it's um, uniform in composition. It's the same throughout. Um, steel is another good example. That's metal. That's mostly iron, but they add stuff to iron in order to make steel. Um, but again, it's all mixed up. So it's uh, evenly dispersed throughout. Uh, salt water, like ocean water, is another good example. The salt, when you dissolve it in water, it evenly distributes. It doesn't collect at the bottom unless it's like super saturated, which we'll get into those kind of solutions um, in a different chapter. So the other type, I said two categories. The other type is heterogeneous. That means it's not uniform throughout. So that means you have layers. Uh, it means if I take a sample from one part and a sample from another part, it's going to have a different composition. Um, it might have the same type of stuff, but maybe even different quantities. Uh, so there's two types of heterogeneous mixtures. There's a suspension and a colloid. And the biggest difference between those is particle size. Um, and how fast it separates. So suspensions tend to have bigger particles. They tend to separate much quicker. Italian salad dressing is a really good example of that. When you are, when if I like go to have a salad and I put my Italian salad dressing on, I need to shake it. And then if I put it down and maybe two minutes later, my brother walks up and he picks up the Italian salad dressing, he has to shake it again because it probably already separated. So if he just pours it out, he's probably just gonna get like oil instead of all the herbs and stuff. Um, a colloid is different. So um, I like to use milk is, the, uh, is what your book uses because milk has fat. So if it sits for a long time, the fat sort of raises to the top and you get like this thin layer of like foamy fat at the top of milk. You guys could try it actually. If, you, if your family drinks milk that has any fat in it, you should be able to, if you're the first one to open the fridge in the morning, like open it really carefully and like look inside the milk and you might see a little like foam layer at the top. Ketchup is easier and most people have like experienced it before, but if you have a ketchup bottle and so like I have, you know, a hamburger or something and I'm going to put ketchup on it, I shake the ketchup. If I don't and I turn it over, that like yellowy stuff comes out. It's just oil, but it comes out of the ketchup. 
So I have to shake it and then I have to put the ketchup on my burger. So if I leave it sit there for like five minutes and then my brother walks up to put ketchup on his burger, he doesn't have to shake it again because it separates so slowly. It takes a long time to separate. Um, there's like medicines that will say like shake before use. Um, those are typically colloids too. They uh, separate if you let them sit for a while. So you have to shake them. Uh, yeah, those are the two types of heterogeneous mixtures. So here's just sort of an overview. I can't, this might be the one from your book. If it's not, you have one very, very similar in your book. Um, but basically in order to determine what things are, you would say to yourself, okay, is it matter? Yes, everything is matter. Then you say, is it uniform throughout? No, heterogeneous mixture. And then even based on particle size, you could determine if it's um, a suspension or a colloid. If yes, if it's uniform throughout, then you say, okay, it's homogenous. And then you say, does it have variable composition? If yes, then it's a homogenous mixture, something like air or what we also call a solution. If we say no, then we say, okay, then that means it's a pure substance. And then we say, can it be separated in, in, into simpler substances? So like carbon dioxide could be broken up into carbon and oxygen. So if you had carbon dioxide as your pure substance, you would say, yes, it can be separated into the carbon and oxygen. Therefore, it's a compound. If it's something like uh, helium, you would say, no, I can't break up helium. It's one atom. So no, the answer is an element. Um, even if you said something like ozone where it's O3, you would say like, I could break it up into three oxygens, but they're all the same. So it can't be separated into two separate substances. So it's still an element. Um, but that's how you would sort of categorize that. Uh, visually, classifying each of these as a element, a compound or a mixture. So this first one with the red um, in these single balls, that is an element they are the same right in my container or in my box right it's the same throughout so it's not a mixture and then um they it only it can each individual like molecule contains the same thing right they're all red so it contains the same thing so it's an element here i come to the second picture where it's blue and these balls are stuck together in twos um, but they're both blue, so it indicates that maybe it's like oxygen, where oxygen is bonded to another oxygen. Uh, we call that diatomic when they appear in twos. And there's seven elements that do it. I like the, the acronym Huckleberry Fino, but it's hydrogen, which is the H, huh, and then coal, which is Cl, and then bur, bur which is uh, bromine, and then uh, you get to Huckleberry, and then Pheno, so the F, which is fluorine, the I is iodine, NO, so pheno, the N is nitrogen, and the O is oxygen. So if you can remember that, it's kind of helpful, huckleberry pheno. But anyway, those are all diatomics, which is what you see here in this second picture. You see a diatomic molecule. And diatomics are an element, but they happen to appear in twos. So this could be something like hydrogen, or it could be oxygen. But regardless, it's an element because they're the same type of atom, even though there's more than one. C, we have a compound. Here we can see that we have a central atom. That's one thing. And then we have these other atoms surrounding. So the purple is different than the green. So they made it different colors to show that they're different atoms. However, in this container, in this box, we only have one type, right? Every molecule is exactly the same. So it's not a mixture. It is a pure substance. And then we can further say it's a compound because it has two types of atoms. And then in this last box, we can say it's a mixture um, because we have different types of molecules in there. Um, we have some elements, which are these blue and these red, and then the compound, which is the green and purple. And yeah, so we could tell it's a mixture. So those are some examples. I hope that um, clarifies things. If not, feel free to ask me some more questions. Um, that's it. Have a great day.